<laughs> Scene four, the forest of Arden. Enter Rosalind for Ganymede, Celia for Aliena, and Touchstone. Oh, Jupiter, how weary are my spirits! I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. I could find in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and cry like a woman. But I must go forth the wicked vessel, and doublet and hose out to show itself courage to petticoat. Therefore, courage, good Alina. I pray you bear with me. I cannot go for no further. For my part, I had rather bear with you than bear with you. <laughs> Yet I should bear. <laughs> Yet bear I... with you than bear you. <laughs> For my part, I would rather bear with you than bear you. Yet for my yet I should bear no cross if I did bear you, for I think you have no mercy in your purse. Money in your purse. Money. <laughs> <laughs> well my part. Well, this is the forest of Arden. I now am I in Arndern. The more fool I, when I was at home, I was in a better place, but travelers must be content. Why, be so good, Poston. Enter Corin and Silvius. Look you, who comes here? A young man and an old in stone talk. That is the way to make her scorn you still. O Corin, that thou knewest how I do love her. I partly guess... I have loved her now. So, Corin, being old, thou canst not guess, though in thy youth thou wast a true a lover, as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure as I think I did never, man so love so, how many actions most ridiculous hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? And two thousand that I have forgot. Oh, thou didst then er, ne'er love so heartily. If thou rememberst not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee run into, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not sat as I do now, wearying thy hearer in thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company abruptly, as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. Oh, Phoebe, oh, Phoebe, oh, Phoebe, Phoebe. Alas, poor shepherd, searching of thy wound, I have by heart adventure find my own. And I, mine, I remember when I was in love, I broke my sword upon a stone and bid him take that for coming a night to Jane smile. And I remember the kissing of her batlet and the cow's dugs that her petty chopped hands had milked. And I remember wooing of the peace cod instead of her, from whom I took two cods and, giving her them again, said with weeping tears, Wear these for my sake. We that are true lovers ran into strange capers. But as all is mortal in nature, so all nature in love, mortal in folly. Thou speakest, why said that thou art aware of? Nay, I ne'er shall be aware of mine own wit till I break my shins against it. Jove, Jove, this chipper's passion is much upon my fashion. And mine, it grows something stale with me. I pray you. What if you question in yon man? For if he if he for gold will give us any food, I faint almost to death. Holla, you clown! He is fool. He is not thy kinsman. Who calls? Your betters, sir. Else they are very wretched. Peace, I say. Would even you to, to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir. 
and to you all. My pretty chipper, if that love or gold can in this desert place buy entertainment, bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here is a young maid with travel much oppressed and faints for succor. Well, fair sir, I pity her, and uh, why wish uh, for her sake more than for mine own? My fortunes were more able to relieve her, but I am shepherd to another man, and do not share share the fleeces that I graze. My master is of surely's disposition and little wrecks to find the way to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. Besides, his coat, his flocks, and bounds of feed are now on sale, and at once our sheep coat now is reason of his absence there is nothing that you will feed on but what is come see and in my voice most welcome shall you be what is what is he that shall buy his flock and pasture oh that young swain that you saw here but uh, uh, Oh, erewhile, and that cares for buying anything. I pray thee, if it stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, and thou shalt have to pay for it, for it of us. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place, and willingly would waste my time in it. Assuredly, the thing that uh, is to be sold. And go with me, if you like, upon request. I shall, the, <laughs> the soil, the profit, and this kind of life. I will your faithful servant be, and buy it with your gold right suddenly. <laughs> Scene five, the forest. Enter Amiens, Jacques, and others. Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me, and turn his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat. Come hither, come hither, come hither. There shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather. Oh, more, more, I pray more. It would make you melancholy, sir, Monsieur Jacques. I thank you, I thank you. Uh, more, I pray more. I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. Uh, more, I, I pray more. My voice is ragged. I know I cannot please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. Come, come, more, more, another stanza. Do I call them stanzas? Call you them um, stanzas? <laughs> <laughs> what you will, Monsieur Jacques. Well, I no, I care not for their names. They owe me nothing. Will you sing? Well, more at your request than uh, to please myself. Well, then, if ever I thank any man, I thank you. But that they call the compliment is like the, the encounter the, the two dog apes. And when a man thanks me heartily, he thinks I have given him a penny. And he renders me beggarly thanks. Come sing, and you that will not hold your tongues. Well, I'll end the song then, sirs. Uh, cover the while. Uh, the Duke will drink under the tree. He hath been all this day to look for you. And I have been all this day to avoid him. He is too disputable for my company. I think of as many matters as he, but I give heaven thanks and thank no boast of them. Come, warble, come. Well, if he doth uh, in 
<laughs> if he doth ambish, ambition then thus, uh, and uh, loves to live in the sun, seeking the uh, food he eats, and uh, pleased with what he gives, gets, come hither, come hither, come hither, he shall, here shall he see no enemy, but winter and rough weather. Aha, I'll give you a verse to this note that I made yesterday in despite of my intention. And I'll sing it. Ah, thus it goes. If it do come to pass that any man turn ass, <laughs> leaving his wealth and ease, a stubborn will to please, Duck Dane, Duck Dane, Duck Dane, here shall he see, gross fools as he, and if he will come to me. <laughs> oh, what's that Duck Dane? Well, tis a Greek invocation uh, to call fools into a circle. I'll go. Uh, I'll go sleep if I can. If I cannot, I'll rail against all the uh, firstborn of Egypt. And I'll go seek the Duke. His banquet is prepared. Scene six: The forest. Enter Orlando and Adam. Dear master, I can go no further. I will die for food. Here lie I down, and measure me on this my grave. Here, then farewell, kind master. Why, how now, Adam? No greater heart in thee. Live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it, or bring it for food to thee. Thy conceit is nearer death than thy powers. But for my sake be comfortable. Hold death a while at the arm's end. I'll be here with thee presently. And if I bring thee not something to eat, I will give thee the leave to die. But if thou diest before I come, thou art a mocker of my labor. Well said. Thou lookest cheerly, and I'll be with thee quickly. Yet thou liest in the bleak air. Come, I will bear thee to some shelter, and thou shalt not die for lack of a dinner, if there live anything in this desert. Cheerily, good Adam. Scene seven, the forest. A table set out. Enter Duke Senior, Amiens, and lords like outlaws. I think he be transformed into a beast. For I can nowhere find him like a man. My lord, he is but even now gone hence. Here was he merry, hearing our song. Uh, if he, compact of jars, grows musical, he will, he shall have shortly discord, discord in the spheres. Uh, go seek him and tell him I would speak with him. He saves my labor by his own approach. How now, Monsieur, what a life is this, that your poor friends must woo your company? What, you look merrily. <laughs> a fool, a fool, I met a fool in the forest, a, a motley fool. Uh, oh, miserable world, uh, as I do live by food, I met a fool, who laid him down and banked him in the sun, and railed on Lady Fortune in good terms, uh, in good set terms, and yet a motley fool. Uh, good morrow, fool, quoth I. Uh, no, sir, quoth he. Call me not fool till heaven and hath set me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with his lackluster eye, said very wisely, It is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago since it was nine, and after one hour more it will be eleven. And so from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and therefore hangs a tale. When I did hear that the motley fool thus moral all the time, um, on the time, my lungs began to crow like a chanticleer. <laughs> that rules should be so deep contemplative. 
<laughs> and I did laugh <laughs> at Sans intermission, an hour by his dial. dial. Oh, noble fool, a worthy fool. Motley's the only wear. What fool is this? A worthy fool. Uh, one that hath been a courtier and says, if the ladies be but young and fair, that they have a gift to know it. And in his brain, which is dry as the rem remain of biscuit after a voyage, he has strange places crammed with observation, in which he vents in mangled forms. Oh, would that I were a fool! I am ambitious for a motley coat. That shall thou shalt have one. Well, it is my only suit, provided that you weed uh, your better judgments of all opinion that grows rank in them. That I am wise, I, I must have liberty, withal as large a charter as the wind, to blow on who I please, for so fools have, and they that are most gullied with my folly, they most must laugh. And why, sir, must they so? Why, <laughs> the, the why is plain as way as parish church. He that a fool doth very wisely hit, doth very, doth very foolishly, though he's smart, not s senseless of the bob. If not, the wise man's folly is anatomized even by the squandering glances of the fool. Invest me in my motley, give me leave to speak my mind, and I will through and through cleanse the foul body of the infected world, if they will patiently receive my medicine. Uh, fie on thee, I can tell what thou wouldst do. What, for a counter would I do but good? Most mischievous foul sin, in chiding sin, for thou thyself hast been a libertine, as sensual as the brutish sting itself, and all the embossed sores and headed evils that thou with license of free foot hast caught, wouldst thou disgorge into the general world. Why, who cries out in pride that can that there and tax any private profit party? Doth it not flow as hugely as the sea that the, that the very weary, very weary, very means do ebb? What woman in the city do I name? When that I say the city woman bears the cost of princes on unworthy shoulders? Who can come in and say that I mean her? When such a one as she, such is her neighbor? Oh, 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 what is he, a basis function that says his bravery is not on my cost? Uh, thinking that I mean him, but therein quit suits his folly to the metal of my speech. Then there, there then, how then, what then? <laughs> Let me see wherein my tongue hath wronged him. If if it do him right, then he hath wronged himself. If he be free, why then my taxing like a wild goose flies, unclaimed of any man. But, uh, ooh, who comes here? Forbear and eat no more. Why, I have eaten none yet. Nor shalt not till necessity be served. Of what kind should this cock come? Of? But thou, uh, this bold man, by thy distress, or else a rude despiser of good manners, that in civility thou seemest so empty, you touched my vein at first. The thorny point of bare distress hath tamed from me the show of smooth civility. Yet am I inland bred and know some nurture. But forbear, I say, he dies that touches any of this fruit till I and my affairs are answered. And you will not be answered with reason. I must die. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food, and let me have it. Sit down and feed, and welcome to our table. Speak you so gently. Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here, and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But... Whate'er you are, and that in this desert inaccessible under the shade of melancholy boughs, lose and neglect the creeping hours of time, 
If ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have knolled to church, if ever sat at any good man's feast, if ever from your eyelids wiped a tear and know what tis to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, in the which hope I blush and hide my sword. Uh, true is it that we have seen better days and have with holy bell been knolled to church and sat at good men's feasts and wiped our eyes of drops that sacred pity hath engendered and therefore sit you down in gentleness and take upon command what help we have that your wanting may be ministered. Then but forbear your food a little while, whilst like a doe I go to find my fawn and give it food. There is an old poor man who after me hath been here weary step, limped in pure love, till he be first sufficed, oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger. I will not touch a bit. Go find him out, and we will nothing waste till you return. I thank ye, and be blessed for your good comfort. And thou seest we are not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. Well, all the world has stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining faith, with mourning, uh, mourning like uh, mewling, um, whining schoolboy, uh, creeping like snail, unwilling to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with the woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then the soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. Then the justice, with fair rind belly, with good cape and line, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws, modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth day shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, uh, and pouch on side, his youthful host well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice curling in his toys, childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Now, scene of all that ends this strange, eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. Welcome, uh, set your venerable burthen and let him feed. I thank you most for him. So had you or need, I scarce can speak to thank you for myself. Welcome, fall to. I will not trouble you as yet to question you about your fortunes. Give us some music and good cousin, sing a song. Somebody else want to sing? <laughs> <laughs> blow, blow the wind, the wind. Now what no so unkind as man's ingratitude to the tooth does not be keen because thou art not seen. Though although thy breath is rude, hi ho, sing hi ho, song to the green holly boughs. Friendship is feigning. Leaving more fully than hi ho, the holly. This life must will be jolly. Freeze, freeze the bitter sky that does me <laughs> no to sigh. As benefits forgot, though thou miss the water's warp, thy sting is not so sharp as the friends remembered not. Hi ho, sing hi ho unto the green holly. Most friendship is waning. Most loving is mere folly, then hi ho the holly, this life is most jolly. There you go. That's the way it should be done. 
If that you were the good Tyrolean son, as you have whispered faithfully you were, and as mine eye doth his effigies witness, most truly limbed and living in your face, be truly welcome hither. I am the duke that loved your father, the residue of your fortune. Go to my cave and tell me, good old man, thou art right welcome as thy master is. Support him by the arm. Give me your hand and let me all your fortunes understand. Act three, scene one, a room in the palace. Enter Duke Frederick, Lords and Oliver. Not see him since? Sir, sir, that cannot be. But were I not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument of my revenge, thou present. But look to it. Find out thy brother. Where, sir, here he is. Seek him with candle. Bring him dead or living within this twelve month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. My lands and all things that thou dost call thine, Worth seizure do we seize into our hands, till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. Oh, that your highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in my life. More villain thou. We'll push him out of doors, and let my officers of such a nature make an extent upon his house and lands. Do this expediently, and turn him going. Scene two, the forest. Enter Orlando with a paper. Hang there my verse in witness of my love. And thou, thrice crowned queen of night, survey with thy chaste eye from thy pale sphere above thy huntress name that my full life doth sway. Oh, Rosalind. These trees shall be my books, and in their barks my thoughts I'll character, that every eye which in this forest looks shall see thy virtue witnessed everywhere. Run, run, Orlando, carve on every tree the fair, the chaste, the unexpressive she. <sighs> Enter Corin and Touchstone. And how like you this shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it is a good life. But in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. In respect solidarity, I like it very well. But in respect that it is private, it is very vile life. Now, in respect that it is fields, it pleases me well. But in respect that it is not in the court, it is tedious. As well it is spare life. Look, you, it fits my humor well. But as there is no more plenty in it, it goes much against my stomach. Hath any philosophy in thee, shepherd? Oh, no more than that, I... I know this, the uh, son, oh boy, I know, I know more and more the son uh, sickens the, <laughs> the one sickens. More one sickens, yeah, there you go. Yeah, the one son. <laughs> one sickens, ton one son. sickens. The one ton son sickens. <laughs> if only I could read this stuff. Uh, the worst at ease he is, and that he that wants money, means, and content is without three good friends. That the property of rain is to wet and fire to burn, that good pasture makes fat sheep, and that a great cause of the night is lack of the sun. <laughs> And that he that uh, learned his learned no wit by matter, nor any uh, art, nor art may complain of good breeding, or comes of a very dull kindred. Such a one is a natural philosopher. Was ever in court, shepherd? 
Oh, never. Truly. Then thou art damned. Oh, nay, I hope not. Truly. Thou art damned like an ill-roasted egg all on one side. For not being in a court, your reason. Why, if, uh, if never wast at court, thou never sawst good manners. If thou never sawst good manners, then by manners must be wicked. And wickedness is sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a perilous state, shepherd. Not a whit touchstone. Those that are, are good uh, manners in the court are as ridiculous in the country as the behavior of the country is most mockable at the court. You told me that you uh, salute not at the court, but that you kiss your hands. Uh, that courtesy would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. Instance, briefly. Come, instance. Why, we are still handling our ewes, and our, their fells, you know, are crazy. Why, do not your courtiers' hands sweat? And is not the grease of a mutton as wholesome as the sweat of a man? Shallow, shallow, a better instant, I say, gum. Besides, our hands are hard. Your lips will feel them sooner. Shallow, again, the more sounder instants come. And uh, they are often tarred over with the surgery of our sheep. And would you have us kiss tar? Oh, the courtier's hand are perfumed with civet. Oh, <laughs> civet, thou worm's meat in respect of a good piece of flesh indeed. <laughs> Learn of the wise and perpend. Civet is of a baser birth than tar. The very uncleanly flux of a cat Bend the instant, shepherd. Uh, well, uh, you are too courtly to wit for me. I'll rest. Wilt thou rest damned? God help thee, shallow man. Make God make incision in thee. Thou art raw. I, sir, I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat get that I uh, wear, and uh, owe no man hate, envy no man's happiness, and glad of other men's good, and content with my harm. And the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. That is another simple sin in you, to bring the ooze and the rams together and to offer to get your living by the copulation of cattle, to be bawed to a bellwether and to betray the she-lamb of a 12 month to a crooked, pated old cockily ram out of the all reasonable match. If thou beest not damned for this, the devil himself will have no shepherds. I cannot see how else thou shouldest escape. Here comes my master Ganymede. Oh, my new mistress's brother. From the east to the western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her work being mounted on the wind. Through all the world bears Rosalind. All the pictures fairest line are but black to Rosalind. Let no fair be kept in mind, but the fair of Rosaline. I'll rhyme you so eight years together, dinners and suppers and sleeping hours accepted. It is the right butter's woman's rank to market. Out, fool. For a taste, if a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosaline. If the cat will after kind, be so be sure will Rosaline. Winter garments must be lined 
so must slender Rosaline. They that reap must chafe and bind, then to cart with Rosaline. Sweet as nut hath sourest rind, such nut, such a nut is Rosaline. <laughs> he that sweetest rose will find, must find love's prick and Rosaline. This is the very false gallop of verses. Why do you infect yourself with them? Peace, you dull fool. I found them on a tree. Truly, the tree yields bad fruit. I will graft it with you, and then I shall graft it with a meddler. Then it will be the earliest fruit in the country, for you will be rotten ere you be half ripe, and that's the right virtue of the meddler. You have said, but whether wisely or no, let the forest judge. Peace. Here come my sister, reading. Stand aside. Why should this a desert be? For it is unpeopled. No. Tongues all hang on every tree that shall civil saying show. Some how brief the life of man runs his erring pilgrimage, that the stretching of a span buckles in his sum of age. Some of violated vows twixt the souls of friend and friend, but upon the fairest boughs, or at every sentence end, will I Rosalinda write, teaching all that read to know, the quintessence of every sprite, heaven would in little show, therefore heaven nature charged, that one body should be filled with all graces wide enlarged, nature presently distilled, Helen's cheek, but not her heart, Cleopatra's majesty, Antalanta's better part, said Lucretia's modesty, thus Rosalind of many parts. By heavenly synod was devised of many faces, eyes, and hearts to have the touches dearest prized. Heaven would that she these gifts should have and I to live and die her slave. Oh, most gentle pulpiter, what tedious homily of love have you wearing your parishioners withal? And never cried, have patience, good people. How now? Back, friends. Shepherd, go off a little. Go with him, Sirrah. Come, Shepherd. Let us make an honorable retreat, though not with bag and baggage, yet with script and scrippage. Didst thou hear these verses? Oh yes, I heard them all, and more too, for some of them had in them more feet than verses would bear. That's no matter, the feet might bear the verses. Aye, but the feet were lame and could not bear themselves without the verse, and therefore stood lamely in the verse. But didst thou hear without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came. For look here what I found on a palm tree. I was never been so rhymed since Pythagoras time that I was an Irish rat, which I can hardly remember. Throw you, who had done this? It is a man. And the chain that you once wore about his neck change you color? I pretty who? Oh, Lord, Lord, it is a hard matter for friends to meet, but mountains may be removed with earthquakes, and so encounter. Nay, but who is it? Is it possible? Nay, I pity. Now, with most petitionary vehemence, tell me who it is. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, and most wonderful, wonderful, and yet again, wonderful, and after that, out of all hooping. Good, my complexion. <laughs> Dost thou think, thou I am caparisoned like a man. I have doublet and hose in my disposition. One inch of the lay more is a south sea of discovery. I pretty, tell me who is it quickly and speak apace. I will thou cause stammer that thou mightst pour this concealed man out of thy mouth as wine comes out of an arrow mouthed bottle. Either too much at once or none at all. I pretty, take the cork out of my mouth that may drink thy tidings. 
So you may put a man in your belly. Is he of God's making? What manner of man? Is his head worth a hat? Or his chin worth his chin worth a bear? Nay, he hath but a little beard. Why, God, God will set more. If the man will be thankful, let me stay the grove of his bear. If thou delay me not the knowledge of his chin. It is young Orlando that rip, tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart both in an instant. Nay, but the devil's take mocking. Speak, say brow and true maid. In faith cause, says he. Orlando? Orlando. Alas the day, what shall I do with my doublet and hose? What did he when thou sawest him? What say he? How look he? Where, it, where went he? What makes him here? Did he ask for me? Where remains he? How parted he with thee? And then shall thou see him again? Answer me in one word. You must borrow me gargantuous mouth first. Tis the word too great for any mouth of this age's size to say I and no to this particulars is more than to answer in a catechism. But doth he know that I am in this forest and in man's apparel? Look, he is as fresh as he did the day he wrestled. It is as easy to count atomies as to resolve the propositions of a lover, but take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance. I found him under a tree, like a dropped acorn. It might be well called Job's tree, when he dropped for such fruit. Give me audience, good madam. Proceed. There lay he stretched along like a wounded knight. Though it be pity to see such a sight, it well becomes the ground. Cry, holla to thy tongue, I prithee it curvets unseasonably. He was furnished like a hunter. Oh, Opinominus, he comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without a burden. Thou brings me out of tune. Do you know I am a woman? When I think I must speak, sweet, say on. You bring me out, soft. Comes he not here? Is he? Sling by and note him. I thank you for your company, but good faith, I had to leave in myself alone. And so had I, but yet, for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. Uh, God by you. Let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be better strangers. I pray you, uh, mar no more trees with uh, writing love songs on their bark. I pray you mar no more of my verses with reading them ill-favoredly. Rosalind is your love's name? Yes, just. I do not like her name. There was no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. What stature is she of? Just as high as my heart. You are full of pretty answers. Have you not been acquainted with goldsmith's wives and conned them out of rings? Not so, but I answer you right painted cloth from whence you have studied your questions. <laughs> You have a nimble wit, I think, t'was made of At Atalanta's heels. Will you sit down with me, and uh, we two will rail against our mistress, uh, the world, and all our misery? I will chide no breather in the world but myself, against whom I know most faults. The worst faults you have is to be in love. Tis a fault I will not change for your best, your best virtue. I am weary of you. Oh, by my troth, I was seeking for a fool when I found you. He is drowned in the brook. Look but in, and you shall see him. Ah, uh, there I shall see mine own figure. Which I take to be either a fool or a cipher. I'll carry it no longer with you. Farewell, good senor love. I'm glad of your departure. Adieu, good monsieur melancholy. Adieu. I will speak to him like a saucy laggy and under the habit play the knave of him. Do you hear, Forrester? Very well. What would you? I pray you, what is o'clock? You should ask me what time of day. There is no clock in the forest. 
then there is no true lover in the forest, else singing every minute and groaning every hour will detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. And why not the swift foot of time? Had not that been as proper? By no means, sir. Time travels in diverse place spaces with diverse persons. I will tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands deal with all. I prithee, who doth he trot with all? Mary, he trots hard with a young maid between, between the contract of her marriage and the day it is solemnized. If the interim be but a sim, sim night, time's pace is so hard that it seems the length of seven years. Who ambles time with all? With a priest that lacks Latin and a rich man that hath not the goat, for the one sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. The one lacking the burden of lean and wasteful learning, the other knowing no burden of heavy, tedious penury. This time, this time, ambles with all. Who doth he gallop with all? With a thief to the gallops, for though he goes as softly as foot can fall, he thinks himself too soon there. Who stays it still with all? With lawyers in the, vac in the vacation, for they sleep between term and term, and then they perceive, they perceive no how time moves. Where dwell you, pretty youth? With this shepherdess, my sister, here in the skirts of the forest, like fringe upon a petticoat. Are you a native of this place? As the coney that you see dwell where he, she is kindly, kindly. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. I have been told so of many, but indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me to speak, who was in his youth an inland man, one that knew courtship too well, for there he fell in love. I have heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I am not a woman, to be touched with so many giddy offenses as he had generally taxed the whole sex with all. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? They were not principal, they were all like one another as halfpence are, everyone's fault seeming monstrous till his fellow fault came to match it. I prithee, recount some of them. No, I will not cast away my, fit, my physic but on those that are sick. There is a man haunts the forest that abuse our young plant with carving Rosalind on their barks, hangs oats upon hawthorns and elegies on brambles, all forsooth they find the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him some good counsel, for he seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love-shaked. I pray you, tell me your remedy. There is none of my uncle marks upon you. He taught me how to know a man in love, in which cage of rushes I am sure you are not prisoner. What were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not, a blue eye, and sunken, which you have not, an unquestionable spirit, which you have not, a bear neglected, which you have not. But I pardon you for that, for simply you having in bear is a younger brother revenue. When you host should be unguarded, your bonnet unbanded, your sleep unbuttoned, your shoe untied and that everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation, but you are not such a man. You are rather point device in your accountments as loving yourself than seeming the lover of any other. Fair youth, I would I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it, you may as soon make her that you love believe it, which I warrant she is after to do than to confess she does. That is one of the points in which women still give the lie to their consciousness. To your consciousness. 
But in good sooth, are you are you he that hangs the verses on the trees, wherein Rosaline is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so much in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I tell you, deserves a well, a dark house, and a whip as madmen to do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the weepers are in love too. Yet I profess, cure it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one, and in this manner. He was to imagine me his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, and which time I would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, 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 full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion of something and all and for no passion truly a thing. And boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this color. Who would now like him, no, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him, the, that I drave my suitor from his mad humor of love to a living humor of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merrily monastic. And thus I cure him, and this way I will take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep heart, that there should not be one spot of love in it. I would not be cured, youth. I will cure you if you would call me Rosalind and come every day to my coat and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. Go with me to it, and I will show, show it you, and by the way, you should tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? Scene three, the forest. Enter Touchstone and Audrey, Jacques behind. Come apace, good Audrey. I'll fetch up your goats, Audrey. And how, Audrey, am I the man yet? Doth my simple feature content you? Your features, Lord warrant us. What features? I am here with thee and thy goats as the most capricious poet, honest Ovid, was among the Goths. Oh, knowledge, all ill uninhabited, worse than Jove in a thatched house. When a man's verses cannot be understood, nor a man's good wit seconded with a forward child, understanding it strikes a man more dead than a great reckoning in a little room. Truly I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest indeed and word? Is it a true thing? Oh no, truly. For the truest poet is the most feigning. And the lovers are given to poetry. And what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers, they do feign. Do you wish then that the gods have made me poetical? I do, truly. For thou swearest to me, thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope thou disdain. Would you not have me honest? No, truly. Unless thou wert hard favored for honesty, coupled to beauty is to have a honey, a sauce to sugar. Uh, I'm a material fool. <laughs> well... I'm not fair, and therefore I pray the gods make me honest. Truly, 
and to cast away honesty upon a foul slut were to put good meat into an unclean dish. I'm not a slut, do I thank the gods I'm foul? <laughs> well, praise be the gods for thy foulness. Sluttishness may come hereafter. Be it as it may be, I will marry thee, and to that end I have been with Sir Oliver Martex, the vicar of the next village, who have promised to meet me in this place of the forest and to couple us. I would fain see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. Amen. A man may, if he were of a fearful heart, stagger in this attempt, for here we have no temple but the wood, no assembly but hornbeat, and what though courage, as horns are odious, they are necessary. It is said, many a man knows no end of his goods, right many a man has good horns, and knows no end of them. Well, that is the dowry of his wife, tis none of his own getting, Horns? Even so, poor men alone? No, no, the noblest deer has them as huge as the rascal. It is the single man therefore blessed? No, as a walled town is more worthier than a village, so is the forehead of a married man more honorable than the bare brow of a bachelor. And by how much defense is better than no skill. By so much is a horn more precious than to want. Here comes Sir Oliver. Sir Oliver Martex, are you well met? Will you dispatch us here under this tree, or shall we go with you to your chapel? Is there none here to give this woman? I will take her on a gift of any man. Uh, truly, she must be given, oh, the marriage is not lawful. Oh, proceed, proceed, I'll give her. <laughs> Good evening. Good master, what you call it. Uh, how do you, sir? Uh, you are very well met. Good to you for your last company. I am very glad to see you. Even a toy in hand here, sir. Nay, pray be covered. Will you be married, Motley? As the ox has his bow, sir, the horse his curb, and the falcon her bells, so man hath his desires, and his as pigeons bill, so wedlock would be nibbling. And will you, being a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Get you, <laughs> get you to church and have a good priest that will that I can tell you what a marriage is. This fellow will but join you together as they join Wainscot. Then one of you will prove a shrunk paddle uh, like a green timber. Warp, warp. <laughs> I am not in the mind, but I were better to be married of him than of another, for he is not like to marry me well. And not being married well, it may be good excuse for me hereafter to leave my wife. Well, go thou with me, and let me counsel thee. Come, sweet Audrey. We must be married, or we must live in Baudry. Farewell, good Master Oliver. Not, oh, sweet Oliver, oh, brave Oliver. Leave me not behind thee, but wind away. Be gone, I say. I will not to wedding with thee. It is no matter. Not a fantastical knave of them uh, all shall flout me out of my calling. It's like a cross that hasn't said hi to me. It's like going... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had birds. When they I had birds in their background and it was perfect for the forest. He goes, nah, he's reading the newspaper right now. What? He doesn't have any more lines. He just wants to do the puppet. <laughs> well, uh, the creepy old man with the broken neck. <laughs> yeah, like that guy. We've seen him before. Right. In the puppet. 
the haunted puppet. I never seen him before. <laughs> <laughs> Igor. Creepy. Is he coming back? Uh, he's calling me Adam. <laughs> he's like reading the paper. Yeah, I got more lines. Reading the paper. <laughs> this one is ocean. How about the ocean. black? Uh, Simba Panther Ninja. What? Yeah, yeah he has three names. <laughs> Simba? Santeria? Simba Panther Ninja. Oh, I like the okay. Panther. It's free. Wow. Ninja. Yeah. But yeah, this is ocean. This, this one is uh, blind and deaf, actually. Oh. You got yes. Your cat in your lap and pet it like this. They're like the, the villain. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, this 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 cat is blind and deaf. Oh, she has a temper. She won't let me. Like if she only if she wants to, I would just scratch me. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's coming. Oh, I'm gonna. Oh, that no, she wants. Sometimes she let me, sometimes she doesn't. Okay. <laughs> you asked for it. It is like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cute. Ocean. You really need ocean? I, one, one sister had a black cat named Shadow. And my other sister had a pet, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, I don't know. It's a, it's a kind of a, it's a karat. You know what a karat is? Great cat. <laughs> and those cats would fight. They would fight. They would like. Uh, I, went, I, got, I got one of the cats that chased underneath the couch, and I went and I grabbed to get the cat and bit the holy hell out of my hand. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> right, the, bitten by the black cat. Shadow. Shadow was a porker, man. She was like, and fluffy. So she was porker. Wow. She was just like a big ball of black fluff. That's cool. I think uh, Korat is a district in Thailand. And yeah, that's where those cats are from. It's a type of wild cat, but it looks like an ordinary cat. Yeah, Korat. Mm -hmm. Or nice. maybe Korat. Mm -hmm. Karato. Its okay. name was. Yeah. Its name. It had its pedigree, and and we called it Perf, short for perfection, because we shortened perfection to Perf. Because if its pedigree, its name was like ping pong pity pat perfection. It, I, it, <laughs> you know the when they get the pedigree names and it's like. Three, you think three names are cool? This they had like about four or five names. Ping That's Pong, cool. Pat Perfection. Per so it was like we're just shorten. We'll take Perfection and shorten it to Perf. Who comes up with those names? The previous Is that like all the ancestors of that cat or something. Yeah, because the pedigree goes back and back and back. Because Karats are pretty prized, right? Mm -hmm. And this had a prized pedigree. And so what they did was they shot this karat, uh, karat up with steroids, you know, for breeding. And it turned into a wild, maniac, clatch, scraw, crack kind of a cat. It was just insanely wild. And so they donated it to the Humane Society. They declawed it. Oh, and no. And neutered it, right? Neutered and declawed. And it was still kind of wild, but the it, oh. Mr. adopts it. I mean, it's like it's animal abuse. But it it wore off, right? And my my sister adopted it, and it wore off, and it was the coolest cat ever. Perf. It was the just the <laughs> coolest cat. Had no claws and no balls, uh, but but it was okay. the. But you rescue him at least, you save him. My sister did, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was it was already um, all like that, right? They they tried to neuter him and declaw him to calm him down, but.
but it was it was in a cage like my sister's like I'll take that cat animals right he'll be fine handle the wild wild animals so sorry guys act three scene you say act three scene four no act four scene one oh uh, uh, oh is it or the four Wait. act three scene four yeah, yeah. yeah. I, don't I, know what act is, I know it's scene one. four the forest yeah i think we're in oh. three and this is yeah probably... act three scene oh four. okay oh, forest yes, act... Yes, Act four, the forest. Enter Rosalind no. and scene four. Scene, whatever. <laughs> Wait a minute. Act three. Help. <laughs> Where are we? I have seen four. See, act four, scene one. Never talk to me. Act never oh. talk to me. Focus, actors. Focus. <laughs> Where are act we? Three. Act, act three. Scene four. Act three, scene four, the forest. Act three. Oh yeah, one more. I'm almost there, guys. So. Oh, tell me when you're there. We'll try okay. it again. This is like a, an iPad. Is it just somehow goes back? Okay, okay, the forest. There you go. Okay. Okay. Mikey, you want to take us in? <laughs> okay. Are we ready? We're all met. Yeah. Peter, are you there with us? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, act three, scene four, the forest. Enter Rosalind and Celia. Never talk to me. I will weep. Do I, pretty, but yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But have I not cause to weep? As good cause as one would desire. Therefore, weep. His very hair is of the dissembling color. Something browner than Judas. Mary, his kisses are to his own, own children. My faith, his hair is of a good color. An excellent color. Your chestnut was ever the only color. And his kissing is as full of simplicity as the touch of holy bread. He hath brought a pair of cast lips of Diana, a nun of winter's sisterhood kisses, not more religiously. The very ice of chastity is in them. But why? Did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Nay, certainly there is no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes. I think he's not a pick purse, not a horse stealer, but for his verity and love, I do think him as con concave as covered goblet or a worm eaten nut. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in, but I think he is not in. You have heard him swear downright he was. Was is not is. Besides, the oath of a lover is no stronger than the word of a tapester. They are both the confirming of false reckonings. He attends here in the forest on the Duke, your father. I met the Duke yesterday and I had much, much question with him. He asked me of what parentage I was. I told him of as good as he. He, so he laughed and let me go. But what talk we of father when there is such a man as Orlando? Oh, that's a brave man. He writes brave verses, speaks brave words, swears brave oaths and breaks them bravely. Quite traverse, athwart the heart of his lover as a puny tilter that spurns his horse but on one side, breaks his staff like a noble goose, but all's brave that youth mounts and folly guides. Who comes here? Mistress and master, you have oft inquired after the shepherd that complained of love, who you saw sitting by me on the turf, praising the proud disdainful shepherdess that was his mistress. Well, and what of him? If you will see a pageant truly played between the pale complexion of true love and the red glow of scorn and proud disdain, go hence a little and I shall conduct you, if you will mark it. Oh, come, let us remove. The sight of lover fettered those in love. 
bring us to the site and you should say I will prove a busy actor in the play. <laughs> Scene five, another part of the forest. Enter Silvius and Phoebe. Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The common executioner whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard falls not the axe upon the humbled neck, but first brings pardon. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by this bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure thee. Thou tellest me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty sure and very pro probable that eyes that are the frailest and softest things who shut the, their <clears throat> coward's gate on a tom tommies should be called tyrants, butchers, murderers. Now I do frown on thee with all my heart, and if mine eye can wound, now let them kill thee. Now counterfeit to swim, why not fall down? Or if thou canst not, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say mine eyes are murderers. Now show the wounds, Mine eye hath made in thee, scratch thee but with a pin, and there remains some scar of it. Lean upon a rush, the cicatrice and capable impressure, thy palm some moment kips, but now mine eyes, which I have darted at thee, hurt thee not, nor I am sure there is not force in I that, that can do hurt. Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever, as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time come not thou near me, and when that time comes, Afflict me with thy mocks, pity me not, as till the time I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you, who might be your mother, that your insult, exult, and all at once, over the wretch? What thought you have no beauty, as by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed? Must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why? What means this? Why do you look on me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's cell work. Odds, my little life. I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No. Fate, proud mistress. Hope not after it. it. Is not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your boogle eyeballs, not your cheek of cream that can entain my spirits to your worship? You foolish shepherd, there wherefore do you follow her like foggy south puffing with wind and rain? You are a thousand times a proper man than she a woman. This is such fool as that makes the world full of it fa ill favored children. It is not her glass, but you that flatters her, and out of you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But mistress, Know yourself, down on your knees, and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For I must tell you friendly in your ear, sell when you can, you are not for all markets. Cry the man mercy, love him, take his offer. Fool is most fool, being fool to be a scoffer. So take her to thee, shepherd, fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you chide a year together. I had rather hear you try than this man would. He's fallen in love with your fullness, and she will fall in love with my anger. 
If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frown looks, I will saucer with bitter words. Why look you so upon me? For no ill will I bear you. I pray you, do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. If you will not know my house, this as the tuff of olives were hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, ply her heart. Come, sister, shepherdess, look on him better, and be not proud, though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Come to our flock. Dead shepherd, now I find I find thy soul of not might who ever loved that loved not at first sight. Sweet Phoebe. Ha! What sayest thou, Silvius? Sweet Phoebe, pity me. Why, I'm sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Wherever sorrow is, relief would be. If you do sorrow at my grief and love, by giving love, your sorrow and my grief were both exterminated. Thou hast my love is not that neighborly. I would have you. Why that were covetous, Silvius, the time was that I hated thee, and yet it is not that I bear thee love. But since that thou canst talk of love so well, thy company which Ernest is was irksome to me, I will endure and I will employ thee too. But do not look for further recompense than thine own gladness that thou art employed. So holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace, that I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now and then a scattered smile that I'll live upon. Knowest thou the youth despect to me erewhile? Not very well, but I have met him off, and he hath brought the cottage and the bonds that the old carlet once was master of. Think not I love him, though. I... As for him, tis but a peevish boy, yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Yet words do well when he that specks them please those that hear. It is a pretty youth, not very pretty, but sure he is mm -hmm. proud. And yet his pride becomes him, he will make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion and faster than his tongue did make a fence his eyes did heal it up he's not very tall yet for his years he's tall his leg but is but so so and yet just well <laughs> there was a pretty redness in his lip a little riper than more lusty red than the mixed in his cheek this was the difference betwixt the constant red and mingled damask. There be some women, Silvius, had they marked him in parcel as I did, would have gone near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. And yet I have more cause to hate him than to love him. For what had he do to chide at me. He said mine eyes were black and my hair black. And now I am remembered, scorned at me. I marvel why I insert and not again. But that's all one. Omittance is no quick quietness. I will write to him a very taunting letter and thou shalt bear it. Wilt thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. I'll write it straight. The matters in my head and in my heart, I will be bitter with him and passing short. Go with me, Silvius. <laughs> Exo, scene one. The forest. Enter Rosalind, Celia, and Jason. 